Hi, and welcome to this week's Wu Wei Wisdom Life Lessons Teaching. It's great to be back with you all. This week, we're going to show you how to move from a scarcity mindset to an abundance mindset. Now, if you are bogged down with a scarcity mentality, you'll know what a draining and limiting way of living your life it is. But do you also realize that it dramatically affects your law of attraction? But the good news is in this teaching, we're going to be digging deep to reveal what keeps you trapped in that scarcity mentality so that you can break free and finally embrace the abundance that is already out there waiting for you in all aspects of your life. Okay, David, so what exactly is a scarcity mindset? Well, I see it a lot with my clients when they can't see any hope or way forward, when they're stuck on what I call the carousel of despair, going round and around and seeing no way out of the situation, just seeing the same thing repeating, just saying that this will never change, this is the way it is, Things are always against me. People are always against me. So it's a very negative and an energy draining way of thinking. And so from what you said there, David, it's like your clients can typically believe there are no opportunities. Yep. There's no good way out. There's no solutions. But also kind of a victim mindset as well comes into play there. Would you say? I would say so. I I think that victim, that word victim mindset. So I know some of my clients dislike that word, but I think it's quite a good word. And you know, I, I think the words are very powerful. And I think it's quite a good word to open up to understand what this scarcity is. As you say, no opportunity. So what they'll say, they won't say particularly there's no opportunity, but what they'll say, if I go for the opportunity, the opportunity will be taken away from me or it won't work out the way I want it to. So therefore, it's not worth doing it. So this is definitely the inner child and we'll get onto this a little bit later. But this is the inner child and basically what that part of your mind is, what we're calling the inner child, is doing is saying, I'm going to stick with the familiar. I'm going to stick with what's comfortable, what I'm used to. Because although it's not working, I know it's familiar. And then I can blame the universe or other people. I'm not going to take responsibility for moving away from this comfort zone. And so therefore, they see everything. <laughs> They're great. If you offer them a solution, that's why I don't do it. Because if you offer a solution, they'll quickly take the opposing thing and now list 10 things why they can't do it. And would you say um, a scarcity mindset is also thinking there is a lack of opportunities, whether it's, I don't know, money, career, health, relationships, but also that I guess your clients are often very successful and have achieved and accumulated a lot of things in their life. But would you say their scarcity mindset makes them believe that they're going to somehow lose it or it's going to be taken away from them? Well, it could be both of those, Alex. It could be that they're, you, they're losing it or what they're good at it doesn't fit their bill. So they'll always be looking for something else. So as you said, they might be very successful in their career, but then they'll say, yes, but I haven't got a good home life or I haven't got a good relationship or I haven't got a good friendship circle or they'll have a great friendship circle and they say, yes, but I'm no good at work. And it, we're back to the whack-a-mole game. It's almost like you can't satisfy them. So this scarcity is, I cannot be fully satisfied. There's always something missing. There's always something I need to get. We're back to the donkey and the carrot, always searching for something else. Oh, my partner isn't what I want, or it may not work out, or what happens if this happens? So they fall into this mindset of scarcity, of problems, of issues, of things not being in abundance, of not understanding that there, there are many opportunities, of seeing only one way. And you know, I said once in a teaching, and I think it's a very 
important teaching when we're talking about scarcity. When you're operating from the mindset of the inner child, it's very narrow. It's almost like you're looking through a pinprick to the world. So everything you see is very restricted and you will easily see problems, worst case scenarios, things that could go wrong, things that might go wrong, things about your health, about your partner's health, about the career, about your boss, about friendships. You're always like on high alert, one of my clients said. I thought it was a good term. They're almost on high alert for problems. And then, of course, as you mentioned in your introductory, that then becomes the mindset, looking for problems. And so they see so many problems out there, then they reduce, then they go into their little box because they believe, although this isn't safer, although this isn't good, it's safer. I'm much more safer in this box. But in that box is a scarcity. So I know, David, a lot of people listening to this teaching will say, okay, well, you've talked about um, almost like a false interpretation or a biased interpretation of the world here because of our inner child. But a lot of people at home will be listening and say, yeah, but David, my scarcity is a fact. I am really short of money. I am... I've tried my hardest and I have opportunities have not come up for me. I'm not, this is just not a misunderstanding of my inner child. This is my reality. Mm -hmm. So how would you respond to that? Well, there's obviously, as everyone is unique, so I'm not trying to answer your particular question. But if what Alex has just asked is about you, I would be working with you and asking you, do you agree with me that money is an energy the energy of the universe. And so therefore, if you have a scarcity of this money, this energy of money, we have to look at how you got to this position. We have to look at the decisions that you made and why you made them. Because if you just then view moving forward, so I would accept absolutely in this position, you have a scarcity of money. You're not, you haven't got an abundance of money. The first thing I I would say is let us do the golden thread and understand what took you to this position because you must learn those life lessons. Once you correct those life lessons, then you can move out of this position because the truth is in the universe, there is no scarcity of money. There's just the scarcity of what you're attracting into your life. So there's really more important lessons that are being identified by money, by love, by career, by whatever dynamic that you want to call that en- that energy. That's why I want to broaden it out, not just about money. It's about all parts of your life. You're, crea- you're creating your career, creating your relationships, your friendships, your health, your well-being. So it's an energy. So if you're in a scarcity mode, a way of thinking, it kind of tells you it's a way of thinking. So let's do the golden thread and retrace what took you to this position. As I said uh, as earlier on, in my experience, may not be for you, but in my experience, it's about what you believe about yourself. It's about keeping yourself very protected. I don't believe, as you know, I've said in many videos, I do not believe in emotional protection because you create your emotions. But you see the people, for instance, with money, they won't want to put themselves out and try a new job or try a new career. Why? Because it might fail, or they might be embarrassed, or they might be caught out, or some other reason. And so the individual reasons are very unique Mm -hmm. to the person, Alex. And what we can do in these videos is talk about the more umbrella energy of the situation. So it's finding what pulled you to this situation. So the, I guess the spiritual Wu Wei wisdom teaching is that energy is in abundance in the universe. Yes. So money is an energy, love is an energy, Friendships. relationships is an energy, Careers. health, yep. uh, career opportunities, whatever we want 
is out is energetically out there for us. And then just to stop you, mm -hmm. so that's exactly what I'm saying. But then people will listen to this and say, well, why haven't I got it? Yeah. Why doesn't it apply to me? And that's where they do the work. And they say, well, what led me to that way of thinking? Yeah. You either agree with me and say, well, en energy is not in abundance. You disagree with me, say en energy is not in abundance, or other people don't get successful careers or have money, which obviously they do. So what is it about your thinking yeah. that brought you to that place? Because what I heard you say, David, was that when you work with clients on, say, money issues or relationship issues in terms of scarcity, you first track back to look at, okay, so what are the decisions you've been making in your adult life that have brought you to where you are today? But actually more fundamental to that are what are the, the core beliefs that you are holding that have driven those decisions that you have made in your adult life that have led you to where you are today and will continue to keep you locked in to this current financial situation or this current relationship situation, unless you examine and change those those core, those deep core beliefs. And that's exactly what I'm saying. Because what you're doing is when you say the scarcity in whatever, you're viewing it from a very narrow point of view, yeah. what I would call the inner child. I want you to consider it viewing it from a Shen point of view, a spiritual point of view. So as Alex has just explained, we have to go back and say, where does this start? Where does this way of thinking start? Mm. And in my experience, it starts in childhood. I was going to say then, David, is a scarcity mindset or kind of thinking on the negative, thinking about lack, is it something we're just born with? Well, we're not born with it, but we we may be born into that environment that important characters in our life, our parents, our teachers, the area that we're born in, that could be important. So I was born in a very working class area. The, you know, people had to go out to work at six o'clock a.m. in the morning till late at night and work very hard. And I believe now I've got a very a kind of hard working attitude about life. So yes, it could be something that we've inherited from our parents, from our important characters in, in our life could be the area that we were born on or, or up with so if we're born in that area it is very comfortable and very familiar mm -hmm. to adopt that way of thinking yeah but that doesn't mean it's true and that doesn't mean it's right for you so for instance i believe that being hardworking is something that i inherited from my upbringing from my industrial background where i was brought up in that and I'm quite happy to maintain that. I enjoy working hard. I think it's a good thing. But I should be able to question that and see whether I want to change it or not change it. Yeah. So I want to keep it, but then I use it to my advantage. I use it for, for me that works better for me. So if we are, if our parents, when we're brought up, if we ever, if they are, either tell us or that we observe from them that, for example, we don't deserve or, you know, we'll always be short of money or, uh, you know, women will always be a problem, men will always be a problem in your life. Yep. You know, if we're, given, if we're given either directly or indirectly those messages, um, of course, as a child, we believe what we're mm -hmm. told by our parents, mm -hmm. Uh, by our teachers, by our, you know, in our the socioeconomic situation we're brought up in. And so we're absorbing that and yeah. we don't question it as a child. But there's the point. Yeah. The golden thread is we should question it. Okay. That's the point, Alex. Yeah. Is we accept. So for me, say, I'll give you my example. When I was brought up with my grandparents, we had tins. I don't know whether this year we had a tin for the milkman, we had a tin for the coal man, we had a tin for the grocery. And every when when my grandmother got the wages in, she would put money in the tin. Now I don't put money in the tin now, but I do like budgeting. <laughs> I'm very as you yeah, know. Yeah. I like budgets. I like to do budgets. 
So that's all that is, is the same thing. So that came from my childhood, but I questioned it, and I don't have a row of tins to put money in, but I think that's a good way of living, yeah. to be yeah. budgeting. So I question it and I adapt it to my way of thinking. But as you said, if we were being brought up and told, oh, relationships are really hard, women will always let you down, men will always let you down, surely when you're a child, I accept that you, uh, you take that in. But really what we're saying is now question it. Mm -hmm. Look at it. Do you want to keep it? Do you want to tweak it? Do you want to throw it out? Just because someone told you, and it may be somebody that you love, you can still love someone and disagree with what they're saying. The two don't go together. Because you love somebody, you do not give them complete authority over your life and your way of thinking. Because they believed in scarcity, you do not have to believe in scarcity. So you may throw the whole lot out, you may adapt it like I have with budgeting, or you may develop your own way. But all of those you have to take and be accountable for changing that. And that's the teaching in this from scarcity, moving from scarcity into abundance. And I guess, David, coupled with the fact that most of us do not question some of those inauthentic uh, teachings we may have received as a child. As adults, we are also exposed to things in the media which, you know, they're trying, you know, insurance things, trying to convince us that this is going to be a problem, disasters around the corner, you know, the world is an unsafe place. All these messages we are getting every day, the world is unpredictable, which it is. And that plays to our inner child's fears and our inner child's belief that there is no abundance, there's a lack, there's a shortage, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. So those messages really work to support the inner child's thinking and make it harder for us to break free of this scarcity mindset. Well, it does if you don't question. Okay. So that's the teaching, really, is to question I say it on every video. What do you believe? I'm sure you can repeat this with me. What do you believe? Very important. What do you believe? Why do you believe it? So say, David, you're wrong. I believe the universe is a scarce place. Why do you believe that? That really is where you'll do the most knowledge and understanding. Where did you get that from? What's your evidence for that? Where, what, and you've got to go to the core belief. Not the consequence of thinking that, which a lot of my clients do. They'll give me the consequences of believing there's a scarcity rather than understanding when they first came to that conclusion, that belief. Why do they think there's a scarcity? And as you said, it could be something they've learned of their parents. It could be the environment they were brought up in. It could be, it could be many things. And then you can question that. Because the consequence is the law of attraction. If you believe there's a scarcity, if you believe there's no opportunity, if you believe you'll always be poor, if you believe you'll never have a great career, if you believe you can't have a good relationship, guess what? That will be the fulfilled. There's the law of attraction. Because you will be, I think your word is confirmation biased. I call, I call it self-fulfilling prophecy. You can't go against your own belief. If you really truly believe that there's no opportunities, how can you look for opportunities? You can't because you're going against your own belief. And it's like energetically, although there is abundance out there in the universe, it's like see. we're closing the doors. That's what we're saying. blocking ourselves you, off from You that. narrow your view yeah. because you cannot see it because you would be disagreeing with your own belief yeah, system. Yeah. You can't see, you know, if you believe that all relationships are going to fail in the end, they won't work, how can you work on a relationship working? Yeah. Because you're having an internal argument yeah. with yourself and then you're not in Wu Wei. Now you're not in your flow. Now you can't reach your potential because now you're going around and around trying to create a self-fulfilling prophecy to prove yourself right. Can I tell you how this works? Yeah. 
self-sabotage. Do you self-sabotage yourself? Think about that word. What a crazy word. I sabotage myself. Why on earth would you sabotage yourself? To prove myself right. Yeah. To prove myself I'm not good enough. To prove myself I can't, I can't cope. To prove myself I can't, I'm stupid, I'm thick. So you mm -hmm. sabotage yourself to prove a negative. And then this affects the abundance. Because if you believe there is no way I can be have a great relationship. There's no way I can have money. There's no way I can have a great career. How can you go and get a great career? Because you're just arguing against yourself. Even if you went for the interview, you'd be saying to yourself, oh, I won't get this job. They won't like me. So are you saying that the inner child would rather prove itself right, our inner child, than be happy and successful? Yes. <laughs> Yes, but Alex. That's so perverse. Yes, Alex. And I am so saying. I am saying. Can I, can I be clear so you can disagree with me? The inner child is so damn stubborn that they will prefer to prove themselves right, hoping that the external world will change to suit them, and that's why they use their emotions. Because if they think that the outside world, external people, will see them suffering in pain. Poor me that they will change. The problem that they've got is they don't. And then the inner child's got another problem. This is now very familiar. Please do not underestimate the word familiarity. I know it sounds a very gentle, very kind of easy word. I can tell you what, this familiarity is so powerful that the inner child prefers this familiarity. If you want to call it your comfort zone, some of my clients call it, it's easier. Some of my clients call it the known. And to, they will stay in their familiarity, their comfort zone, their known, because doing something else means they've got to step out of their comfort zone. And that's why the inner child will stay, even when they know it doesn't work. And so I would imagine because the inner child wants to stay with this familiar habit of thinking, with these familiar scarcity beliefs, when you start to dig around and start to try and find the original incidents, as you say, for when did you first start to believe this? When did you first start to believe in lack, in scarcity, in not enough, in I don't deserve, I'm not good enough? The inner child will resist this process. Absolutely resist it. Because, <laughs> because the inner child then, the inner child will see that as almost like a personal attack. Yeah. The inner child does not believe. It's like a child. That's why I like the analogy of a child. When has your physical child ever come up to you and says, yes, you're right, mama. They'll have a temper tantrum. I had a daughter that used to storm off to a bedroom every time something didn't go out of the way that she wanted it. So the inner child will create emotions rather than being able to look at something in a very balanced, yeah. authentic, calm way. And this is what I try and teach my clients. One of the first things to do when you're doing the inner child work is learn to drop your shoulders. Take a breath. I've done a meditation on this if you want to follow it. What you must do is listen to the inner child and then answer its questions. So the inner child will give you all of these things. It, no, it's not fair. This is one thing the inner child will say. It's not fair. And then you have to understand and talk to the inner child of what his interpretation of fairness is. Why does he believe that things are not fair? And then you'll find the first incidences mm -hmm. where it happened. Well, this is what I was going to ask you. When you're working with your clients, David, how easy is it for them when they're working with you or if they're not working with you, if someone's listening to this, what do it wants to do the self-inquiry by work by themselves, how easy is it to get back to that first incident? Because of you know, we might be talking about something that happened 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago even. Yeah, you know, I think it's a good question, Alex. And I think for everybody it's slightly different. I think it's one of the things it's how stubborn the inner child is, and I can tell you. I meet some stubborn inner children. But remember, that doesn't mean to say they're evil. It doesn't mean to say they're terrible. They're not devils. They're not demons. They're just a child stuck. 
and it's how you can build up that relationship with the inner child. The two main things that I find is, first of all, the inner child will want to rush you on. It doesn't want to go slowly. It will say, well, I'm bored. I don't want to answer that because that's one of the things. It doesn't want to answer the question. So you've got to learn to drop your shoulders, take a breath, and listen to what the inner child is saying. So if you can get the child to slow down and tell you, such as, it's not fair, and you say, okay, when I hear an inner child saying it's not fair, what they're saying is not the way I want it to be. Mm -hmm. So you then slow down and you speak to the inner child. The next thing you have to do, which again, nearly all of my clients fall down on this, is to make sure you hear what the inner child is saying. And now we're going to do a mini series soon mm -hmm. on this about what I do when I'm working with my clients. I kind of say, oh, are you, this is what you're saying. Are you saying this? So you repeat back so to the I, inner child. You repeat back. So the inner child part of your mind knows that what we're dealing with. I understand. I accept. I acknowledge what you're saying. And then you'd be saying, so why do you believe that uh, because your parents had no money, say, for instance, why do you believe that applies to you? And you've got to learn to be quiet, drop shoulders, take a breath, and give the child time to formulate their answer. And we'll be going through this. Yeah. We're going to do a series of smaller sessions, just five, six, seven minutes on different little techniques on how to deal with a child. But this is what I go through with my with my uh, my uh, students and and clients. Sorry, my uh, as my clients. Now some of them can get onto this very quickly and easily, and they enjoy it. Some of them, their inner child doesn't like this idea, yeah. <laughs> and they will resist. They will basically have a bit of a strop, and you have to learn how to deal with strops. Yeah. So it's like your physical child when you're trying to communicate with them and they don't want to hear. Mm -hmm. It's the same principle. That's why I like the analogy of the inner child. But you have to get down to what it believes yeah. and why it believes it. And that, and you do that by quest that gentle questioning process, listening, repeating back to the inner child to make sure you've understood it correctly, and then to question again, yes. question again, question again. again, and then eventually you'll get down to the the original seed of the experience when they first. It's almost like when they were first programmed, when our our mind was first programmed incorrectly yes. whether on this issue of scarcity yes so i think the main question we get in our community and the people will say i've done the golden thread work david and i've got down to i'm not good enough so where so what do i do now so this is the inner child saying now i'm not good enough so you start the process you say, again you say okay sweetheart why do you believe you're not good enough mm -hmm. because didn't just come to him, didn't float around the air. There's, as you say, an experience, an incident, a person, mm -hmm. somebody here, they gathered that. So you've got to keep doing the golden thread until you come to the core, the reason. And then you can start exploring that. So if it's scarcity, then you've got to understand, so why do you believe that? Well, I was brought up in scarcity. Yes, that's true, you were brought up in scarcity. But why do you believe that it, because you were brought up in scarcity, you have to live in scarcity? Now, those type of the questions, the inner child, then you have to give them time, breathe, relax, to think about that, to work that through. Because I like the word programming. A lot of my clients don't like the word programming, but I notice you used it. And I like that word because we're all programmed our thinking are programmed by important people in our lives, teachers, parents, grandparents, siblings, but also environment where, as where we're brought up and how we were brought, brought up. And the majority of that programming is fine, absolutely fine. We don't have to touch it. But we should be able to look at each part of the program yeah. and see, do we need to tweak it? Do we need to change it? Can we keep it? And that's what we should be doing, taking the accountability and the responsibility, especially if it's about scarcity, because this will affect your life right through. When the opposite is, I believe we live in abundance. Mm -hmm. Abundance is there. 
And if you change that programming, that mindset to living in abundance, then you'll start to see the outcomes will change. Mm, brilliant. Thank you, David. Well, I hope you have enjoyed this teaching. We've got plenty more uh, teachings on how to do the inner child reparenting work and also a whole series of teachings on the law of attraction, many of which talk about the sort of issues we, we've worked on today. If you have enjoyed the teaching, please do let us know and maybe share it with someone else who you think would also benefit. And David works one-to-one -one with clients every week all over the world via Zoom video call on these sort of mindset issues. So if you are interested in learning more about David's consultations, I will also put a link to more information in the show notes below about those sessions as well. And finally, please don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We produce new teachings every week and we would love to share your journey with you. Bye-bye.